uh, if you got your Bibles, uh, uh, open them. Um, we're in uh, uh, Genesis. If this is your, your first week with us, we're actually going through the entire uh, book of Genesis, chapter by chapter, uh, verse by verse. Um, it's going to take us about 55 years. Um, so at a certain point, I'll retire and, um, and my son will take it over. And um, if that's the direction he goes, he might become a filmmaker, I don't know. Um, and then when we're done with Genesis, we're actually going to study the entire book of Revelation. And so we're going through the first book of the Bible and the last book of the Bible. And, um, and it's going to be great. Hey, I also just want to do this before we actually dive into this. Um, I just want to celebrate all of our students that are home from college or school, all of our students that are home from Bethel. I saw Barb. I saw David Kusick over, over here. There he is, buddy. If you're a student and you're home from, from school, you want to just stand to your feet. We'll just welcome you home for the holidays. Awesome. God bless you. God bless you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We love what, love what Jesus is doing in Bethel and excited, excited for you guys. Okay, uh, Genesis 1-1. Um, that a sheet in the first epoch of time, before there was anything, there was him, 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 Elohim, mighty God, the one who is worthy to be worshipped. And what did mighty God do? He, bara, is to prepare, to form, and to fashion. What? The heavens and the earth. Now at this time, the earth was tohu vavohu, 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 which means crazy, nonsensical, uh, uh, chaotic, okay? Um, and, Fatty, look at me. Koshek, koshek, which is the, he was, obviously you can tell I'm, I'm fluent in, and thus he brew. Um, and darkness, okay, the, what I call the Kosek, but it's the Kosek. Darkness, okay, was upon the face of the great deep. So here you have chaos and darkness. And there in the middle of the darkness, there in the middle of the chaos is the Ruach, which is the very Spirit of God, the breath of God. The presence of God was right in the middle of the chaos, right in the middle of the darkness. And what's he doing? He's not escaping it. He's not trying to survive in it. He's hovering in it. He's brooding in it over the face of the waters. And there in the chaos, there in the darkness, there with the presence of the Lord, God speaks. Okay? And what does he say? Let there be Light And God saw that the light was tov. It was suitable and pleasant. Okay, It was useful and beautiful. And he approved of it. And then God carved it. Separated it. He separated the light from the darkness. And the light he called. Good job. And the darkness he called. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. On the second day, God created the rakia, which is a dome. It was uh, uh, the the act, the carving, the separating of the chaos waters. And in this, the second day, God creates the skies above with the waters below. And the rakia becomes the very place um, that is going to uh, be an Atmosphere. It's this place where, where, where it's this womb with waters above and waters below. And it says that it was tov. It was fitting. It was admirable. It was useful. And it was beautiful. And God approved of it. And then God said, let the earth put forth um, tender vegetation. Um, uh, uh, sorry, let's go verse 10. And God called... Uh, uh, let's go verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be collected in one place and let dry land appear. And the dry land he called earth and accumulated the water. So here we see, this is the moment when there's, and out of the waters comes forth, it is I, Mountain Rainier, and then uh, and then Mount St. Helens also comes up. It is I, Mount St. Helens, and I am angry, right? 
I could build my top, right? This is why I do children's church on my off time. Okay. Uh, have you guys seen any of the stuff we're doing in the children's church? It's really cool. Time traveling, Thomas and Carl. Yeah, anyways, that there is a good time. Um, so dry land is good. And, and, and what does he say? He, he looks at the earth. He sees the mountains, okay? And he says, it is tov. It is fitting and admirable. It is useful. Um, and it is beautiful. And he approved of it. And then God said, let the earth put forth tender vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees, and all, there's all these trees that start coming, and fruit that starts coming forth, it's vegetation, and, and, and God looks at, at how he is clothing the rock with all of this vegetation, and, and, and over and over and over it talks about seed, and, and you, you know that Moses thinks that this is so significant, why? Because Elohim is creating vegetation that possesses the ability ability to create vegetation that likewise has the ability to create vegetation. So, so Elohim is creating creation that can keep on creating creation. Imagine if you could create something that could then create something. Okay, let's stop it. Okay. Okay. Imagine if you could create something in your own image and likeness that could then go on and create something in its own image and likeness that could go on and create something in its own image and likeness. Imagine if you could. You can. We do. And we do this in the image of God. So he does the vegetation, and there was evening, and there was morning, okay, vegetation the third day. We came to the fourth day, which is where we were last week, the, the meor, and God said, let there be meor, which is light in the expanse of the heavens, okay? So we see the, the creation of the cosmos, okay? The, the cosmos, the, the universe, cosmos means order, and so again, God brings order out of the chaos to create the cosmos and um, and he and he speaks and he gives an assignment he gives a job description um, to the to the planets and he says you You've got a role to play. You are to be useful. You are to separate the day from the night. You are to be signs and tokens of God's provident care. And you are to mark seasons, days, and years. You are to be the very first com uh, computer for all of hum humanity that humans would have directions and understand times and seasons. So God gives the very first computer, which is, which is the planets and, and, the, and the stars. Isn't God amazing? Yeah, yep. and then he made two great lights, okay, and he doesn't name them yet. The Canaanites would, would, would name the sun, the moon, and the stars with, with pagan names, but here he just says, I, I'll create two great lights, okay, the one that we know as the sun to rule the day, and the lesser light that we know as the moon to rule the night. He also made uh, the stars, verse 17. And God said to the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was tov. It was fitting and pleasant, useful and beautiful, and he approved of it. There was evening, there was morning. The fourth day. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the fifth day, and that'll begin in verse uh, verse twenty. Uh, let me just say that this is the the last study in the book of Genesis uh, for the year. Uh, we will continue this in um, on January 9th, uh, where we'll get into the sixth day, which will be interesting. Uh, 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 charismatic prophetic believers love the number six, so that'll be fun. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, we're actually going to go into, like uh, Eric was just covering, kind of the Christmas schedule. So tonight's actually going to be the last Sunday night, um, un also until January um, 9th. Uh, tonight will be cool. We'll be covering peace on earth. We will light the peace candle, and everybody will be like, whoa, right? It'll be awesome. Um, the kids are going to be singing and marching, and it's going to be epic. It'll be really, really good. Uh, when we come back on the ninth, yes, we'll be, we'll be, uh, we'll be in um, Genesis, the sixth day. But I just wanted to mention this really quick. Uh, starting on January 9th in our evening service, 
we will begin a deep dive study, on, only on su- Sunday nights, of, of looking at the, re- at the supernatural reforming mystics in church history and God's generals. So we're going to do a long-term study going all the way into the spring where we're going to be looking at the Desert Fathers. Um, we're going to be looking at um, some pretty crazy, uh, some pretty c- crazy uh, Catholics. <laughs> uh, we'll also be looking at... Um, uh, uh, John Alexander Dowie, John G. Lake, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, um, and we're going to be doing a pretty uncensored look at who these men and women were. Uh, you're going to see the battle for the supernatural in the church. We're going to be pretty transparent as far as how the supernatural was such a normal part of Christianity until the Great Reformation, and then the restoration of the supernatural uh, with the Zuzis Street. It's, it's going to be it's going to be a, be a deep dive, and it's going to take us some time. And so, if you don't know uh, the supernatural heritage of the Christian faith, you're definitely going to want to be a part. Of it. Also, if you already know our our heritage, you're going to want to be a part. Why? Because the reminder of these things is going to create a realm of expectation that God is going to honor. That's going to translate, I believe, into a season of encounters uh, for Seattle Revival Center. And we're going to need that. We are going to need that. So um, uh, as far as where, where we are going. All right, everyone just declare the fifth day. Okay. Uh, what happens on the fifth day? God creates the creatures of the sea and the air. Uh, let's begin. Verse 20. And Elohim, mighty God, the one worthy to be worshipped, declares, let the waters bring forth abundantly and swarm with living creatures. And let... And let birds fly over the earth in the rakia, in the uh, open expanse. So within the dome, the, these birds can fly. That's their bird cage. Um, uh, within uh, the heavens. Verse uh, 21, God created okay, uh, the tanin, which if anybody has um, uh, the amplified classic, your Bible will actually read like this. Um, our children will be studying this, not actually today, but they will be going through the scripture on January 2nd. Um, and uh, we've got a child-friendly version of this scripture. Because when you read this, it basically is translated, on the third day, God created the great sea monsters. That's how it reads in the Amplified. The word there, and God created the Tanin, would have communicated to its audience an association with what the Hebrews would see as chaos monsters that were believed to inhabit the cosmic waters. So on day three, God created the cosmic chaos monsters that, uh, that occupy the seas. How does this not sound like the Power Rangers? Like every Power Rangers episode, don't ask me how I know, but it always ends with a crazy cosmic chaos monster coming out of the waters. This word tanin uh, can be used to describe beast throughout the Old Testament, including uh, Psalm 74, the famous Leviathan, a uh, multi-headed beast uh, that falls in the category of the, tan- of the tanin. But here, in Genesis 1, Moses describes these creatures not as antagonists that need to be defeated, but as creatures that the Lord looks down upon and says they are good. Here you have these chaos monsters of the deep that are not villains, and there is no fear as there is no fall. So you have something that appears quite scary because of our fear programming that goes back to Genesis chapter 3. But there are these creatures that look terrifying. That were, ex- that were created to be subservient to mankind. Why is this a big deal? Because the world creates monsters because man should be afraid of monsters. Again, going back to the fear programming. What you have is perhaps on the third day, the creation of animals within the seas and the deep, but you also have basically what could be um, water dinosaurs. Uh, This word can also be translated dragons. Now, What's interesting here about this is that um, we do have a fossil record with terrifying sea creatures, 
not only that, but from time to time, some pretty terrifying sea creatures actually surface. So not only were there once terrifying sea creatures, but you can trust me on this. I've watched enough YouTube videos. There are still terrifying sea creatures that live in the deep. Have you guys seen like the oar fish that came up? Like Google that, YouTube it. That thing's like 100 feet long, looks like an eel and has the head of like a dragon. That thing came up, it's all swimming around. I would have taken my AK to that pub. I, would have, pow, pow, pow. I don't care how rare it is. Things that evil need to be blown to smithereens. How about the, um, sorry, did I say that? <laughs> did, I, did I say that loud? <laughs> sorry, it's Christmas time. I'm talking about shooting up oarfish. What about the, um, <laughs> welcome to SRC, right? I swear I was called to Texas. You know, I, um, <laughs> um what about the, uh, oh, I forget the name. I was talking about the telescope fish, I, I believe is the name of it. It just recently discovered. Have you guys seen this thing? It, it looks just, ab- it looks like an alien. It really does. And the thing about it, it lives, lives deep sea, it can swallow um, food its same size. Put yourself in its shoes for a second. Imagine doing that. Right? Imagine like a, a, a filet mignon that's six feet tall. Come on, that's a good visual. So anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, here you have these. Uh, uh, now, I also just want to hit on this. You could say this is a bit of a tangent, but I think it's really interesting when it comes to uh, interesting conversations with our kids. The fossil record points to all kinds of creatures that once roamed the earth that no longer roam the earth. And these things are seen as these terrifying Jurassic type monsters. We know that when God created all the, the living creatures, he said that they are useful, that they are beneficial, and they are beautiful. And here's what that means. This is my own take, and this is a bit of a, of a tangent, but I believe that when, when we see the restoration of all things, I believe when the, when the, when the, when, uh, when the, the new Jerusalem comes out of the heavens and kisses the earth, and we see the restoration of the earth, and, and we see Satan uh, judge and thrown to the lake of fire, and, and, we, and we get to see earth renewed to her original sense of beauty and purpose. I believe that we're going to see the restoration of every animal that was, ev- that was ever created. I believe we're going to see a restoration of all the original plants that were ever. I think that God's original blueprint is is going to be restored, and I believe that we are going to see these crazy, monstrous creatures that are no longer terrifying. Why? Because we are no underneath the programming of fear, and we will get to experience the first airplanes that were pterodactyls and the first automobiles that were raptors. If you're a visitor, I apologize. Let's keep, let's stay, let's keep it biblical. Here we go. The problem is we watch these movies like Jurassic Park where they're, where they're riding these dinosaurs and we think, wow, that's so creative. Surely God could never do something like, and I, I am telling you, the most creative stuff that you see in the movies has nothing on heaven. It has nothing on the restored earth. We're going to do things that you didn't even think were allowed. I am telling you, it is cool. Our God is amazing and it's going to be so great to get some things cleaned up. Thanks for going on that, on that adventure with me. Okay. 21b, and God creates every living creature. Everyone say living creature. This is really big because the creation of living creatures is going to bring forth a response from Father that's really going to frame up uh, kind of our um, our theme um, for for the morning. This is the first designation of living creatures, and we're going to see here in a couple weeks that um, that we likewise as uh, humans in a in a dom will be categorized as living creatures as well. Um, but what's different about uh, those who come from a dom is that we are image bearers, and it gets very, very special. And there is a distinguishing between those who are in a dom and those who are just mere generic living creatures that, that puts a foot in the face of anybody that would try to put humans in the same category as a gorilla, or those who would say that humanity is just just any other animal, they are wrong. Why? Because we have our origin story. We have the original manuscript as far as where we are, where we have come from. And so as we study the formation of Adam and how God brought life, and uh, it, it is absolutely stunning. But we do see here that God creates every living creature that moves, 21C. 
which the waters brought forth abundantly. This is fascinating. Every living creature that moves came from the waters according to their kinds, including every winged bird according to its kind. And, and God saw that all of these creatures, okay, and these are sea-bearing creatures and, and creatures of the air, and he sees that they are uh, suitable, admirable, useful, and beautiful and he says, it is good. It is tov. Now this is fascinating to think that, that, that the creatures of the air initially came from uh, uh, the seas. In fact, um, this is a new thought for me. I haven't really studied this a lot in the past. But I had an amazing conversation with a brilliant businesswoman that, that's here on uh, the east side. She was sharing with me. How many of you guys have been to the Bible Museum? Have you guys heard about the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C.? Um, uh, uh, Carrie Summers, who is the, uh, the brain, from what I understand, behind the Bi Bible Museum, he and his team have developed a children's curriculum uh, that takes place through virtual reality where children could put on these goggles and experience the first seven days of creation. And she, did, she had no idea that I was going to be um, teaching on the fifth day of creation. But she says you can put on these goggles and you can watch, you can watch the waters boiling with life and then you can watch the birds come flying out of the waters to take flight. And you can look up and you can see the birds uh, dancing. You can see the fish are coming up and dancing in the air. Um, she said it's the most phenomenal uh, uh, thing. In fact, I hope it's okay I share this. Um, we'll, we'll just do it. So uh, high, high up officials in Israel have asked to use this curriculum in the public schools in Israel, even though it blatantly teaches Jesus, they love it because it also teaches English. And it's so brilliant and beautiful. Can I tell you what I love about this? It is, it is so awesome that finally the bride of Christ is creating something that is tov. It's cutting edge. It's not 10 years behind. They're not copying the world. They're using new ways of doing things to communicate an old and brilliant and timeless message. And this stuff is happening right now. Um, I could go, there's some stuff that's happening here at SRC. There's some stuff that we're involved in. There's some very crazy conversations. Um, we're, God, we're, we're, <laughs> the Lord's going to use us as a community, not only us, but I believe the, the Lord is fi uh, uh, positioning us in this season to do some pretty cutting edge things in the area of education. And it's going to be it's going to be phenomenal, and I believe our kids are going to have experiences um, that really solidify and paint out. I, I never had the visuals of this painted out as a kid in in, my, in the teaching of the Genesis account, but uh, we're about to see our children not just hear about something, but our children are about to experience Genesis in a three D world. It's pretty wild. Okay, so um, from the waters came forth. Abundant life. Again, uh, I've never really studied out the idea of things coming into, uh, uh, of the birds actually coming out of the seas. Um, I'm personally, I'm, I'm not a fan of Calvinism. You guys already know that if you've been here longer than a week. Um, it, it, I'm allergic to it. It makes me itch. Uh, but I do like, from time to time, a little John Calvin. Okay, uh, oftentimes, there's a big difference between uh, uh, the, the original thinker of various philosophies and the followers. Okay? Um, uh, sometimes there's, uh, there's certain people that I can listen to directly, but I can't really stand their followers. Okay? It, it's not that bad with Calvinists. It's just, it's just you know... Uh, there's Jesus, okay? So anyways, all right, we'll stay focused. John Calvin, uh, he has a quote uh, on the fifth day of creation because there have always been a, a lot of haters and people that would question the seas as being the womb for creation, that creation was coming out of the seas. And so this is John Calvin, and he says, it seems, however, little consonant with the reason that he declares that birds to have proceeded from the waters. Therefore, this is seized upon those doubting men as an occasion, um, uh, 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 skip a beat, but although uh, there should appear though appear no other reason but that it so pleased God. Why would God do this? Why would God um, be creating and bring birds out of the seas? John says, 
because it pleased God? Would it not be becoming in us to acquiesce in his judgment? Why should it not be lawful for him who created the world out of nothing to bring forth birds out of water? And what great absurdity, I pray, has the origin of birds from the water than that of light from darkness? He said it's no more too absurd to believe that birds came from the water than to believe that actual light came forth from the darkness. Therefore, let those who so arrogantly assail their creator look for the judge who shall reduce them to nothing. This is what he says. Are you wrestling with the fact that birds came from the water? Who are you to wrestle with that fact? Who are you to wrestle with the creator? Does this offend you? Tough. <laughs> this is back when preachers just were like, you know what I'm saying? Like, does that offend you? <laughs> this is way before the seeker-sensitive movement, okay? <laughs> you don't like it? Get lost, right? <laughs> that's not me. That's John Calvin, okay? All right. Uh, <laughs> nevertheless, if we must use physical reasoning in the contest, we know that the water has great affinity with the air than the earth has. But Moses ought rather to be listened to as our teacher who would transport us with admiration of God through the consideration of his works. And truly the Lord, although he is the author of nature, yet by no means has followed nature as his guide in the creation of the world, but has rather chosen to put forth such demonstrations of his power as should constrain us to do what? To wonder and marvel. Isn't this fascinating? This is what John's saying. Our God, he does what he wants. He does it his way. And he does it so that we will look and be astonished. Oh, so you don't have the answers to your why? John Calvin would say, tough. He's God. You're not. Be astonished and worship him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know about you, but God doesn't usually give me the why. How about you? I've asked God why so many times. In fact, I asked God why one time. This is, this is free. I asked God why. And it was, a, it was a whining why. How many of you have ever had a whining why? Yeah. I did a whining why. And you know what God did? He did like a kinder version conversation that he had with Job. Because Job asked God why. And then God had a couple questions for Job. <laughs> and you know what he said to me? He said, okay, you think you can do better with your storyline? You think you can do better with your history? You think you can do better with your story? Rewrite it. Make it perfect. Take out all the drama. Take out all the heartbreak. Go ahead and rewrite your story. And where does that put you? And you know what I realized? If I could have carved out the perfect storyline for myself, that makes me a religious, pompous, self-righteous prude who doesn't walk with a limp and certainly cannot be trusted. Yep. But enough about me. Let's go to verse 22. And Elohim, everyone say mighty God. And this is our word of the day, Barak. Now some of you conservatives are getting triggered. It means, it means blessed. This is the difference. God has been creating for many days, but this is the very first time that he, Barak, this is the very first time that Father blessed. Why? This is a new category of living creatures. And he blessed them. And in blessing them, he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters and the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. Everyone declare, be fruitful, multiply, uh, sorry, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. This word barak, it means blessing. This is the first occurrence of this word in the book of Genesis. In fact, this is going to be a major theme throughout our study of the book of Genesis. This is such a big deal. We're going to keep coming back to it. This is the first appearance. Um, I'm going to read to you an excerpt from uh, Brian Simmons on his commentary on uh, Genesis. This is what he says. 
Blessing is perhaps the most important theological glue that holds Genesis together, and it connects it with the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. In Genesis 1, God blesses humans, and then they lose that blessing, soon to come in chapter 3. But God returns to this theme again in Genesis 12, where he seeks to restore this blessing to humanity once more through choosing a couple, Abraham and Sarah, and their Zerah, their seed, their offspring, their nation, and this blessing is manifested in several lives like Abraham and Joseph. This is uh, the definition or a definition, a working definition of Barak, and it is, uh, say it with me, an empowerment for abundant living in every sphere of life. I want you to uh, declare this with me. I am empowered for abundant living in every sphere of life because I'm blessed by my Father. So God sees these amazing creatures. He even sees these crazy sea monsters. And he doesn't just approve of them. He blesses them with divine empowerment for fruitfulness and for multiplication. This is what he says. I created you so I will bless you so that you can increase and grow. I would just declare God created me and he wants to bless me with the ability to increase and grow. How do you know that God is blessing you? Because you are stepping into a divine supernatural ability to increase and grow. Never once in the Bible do we see uh, God equating blessing to maintaining something, decreasing, or shrinking back. It is not the desire of the Father that the kingdom of God would be maintained. Jesus said just before he left, he said, you are to go, where? Into all the world and do what? Take dominion of it. This is what Jesus says. You are to go into all the world and disciple nations. What, do you, what does that mean? It means to assume ownership. We're going to get into that when we, when we come back. Uh, after the holidays, we're going to come back. And we're going to look at, at dominion and authority. That's going to be the theme that's established on the sixth day. There's been a war in the body of Christ for our revelation of dominion and authority. And we've been told that our role is to maintain something, is to hide out, is to survive, is to escape. But you know the kingdom of God. You know this, this message, this theme is this. I have blessed you, and the blessing empowers you to be a blessing to people, places, things, resources. Because I have blessed you, that you will know the, the Midas touch, if you will, of the sons and daughters of God, because everything the sons of God touches turns to gold. It is time for us to value value, and it is time for us to, to, to quit coming up with excuses for why we are shrinking back and why we are cowering and why we are following uh, what the world says is success, what the world says is, uh, here's what the world will do. The world will give you a thousand excuses to justify poverty in your soul, in your body, in your finances, that everything from the school system to the church system exists to create people that will just just get on the treadmill of this world and just, just show up. All you got to do is just show up. This is the expectation of humanity in our generation. Just show up. Go, go to work. Just show up. Just do what you're told. Just, just sit down. Shut up. Listen to the teachers. Like, we're going to teach you how to perform. We're going to teach you how to not get rejected. We're, like This is what the, what the world does. We're going to teach you how to not get rejected. You see these churches that are cowering, like, like just, like, and I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, but, but I'm really, really worried because because as a church in America, we say that success looks like not being rejected. And the problem with that is Jesus. Why? Because his faith and father got him unjustly crucified. And we don't want to have the appearance of something lest we get unjustly crucified. 
We don't want to do something because it could be offensive. What will people think? The problem, listen to me now, the problem is that you've been blessed of God. And the blessing sets you apart. And you're going to see this theme throughout Genesis. You're going to see this theme throughout the scriptures. You don't have the luxury of being blessed by God and then hiding in a cave. That you don't get to say, I'm in a hiding season when your hiding season's been the last 30 years. The problem is, God wants to bless you. Why? Because he loves you. Well, yeah, it sounds like the prosperity gospel. Then you better rip out the entire book of Genesis. And you, there's, there's so many parts of your Bible you got to rip out. Why? Because wherever the presence of the Lord is, it is evidenced by blessing and favor. It sets people apart. And it's not just a blessing to be consumed upon you that God wants to bless you so that he can flow through you to bring forth a terraforming of the earth that sin would get punched in the face, that addiction would get judged, and that there would be a a generation of Christ people on the earth that are walking in an authority and knowing that I don't have to cry out for more. Why? Fathers, bless me. Oh, and you don't think he's blessed you? He blessed the cosmic sea dragons, and he hasn't blessed you? He blessed you before you were born. He did not bless you because you repented. He did not bless you because of the family that you were born to. He did not bless you because you're white. He did not bless you because you're an American. God bless America. He blessed you because you are of his seed. He blessed you because he bled for you. He died for you. I believe that God blessed bless Elon Musk. Well, he, uh, he's, a, he, he's part of the Illuminati. He, 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 he's an image bearer of the Most High God. And what separates Elon Musk from a lot of us is that we have believed enough religious garbage to put speed limits on our lives that God never placed on our lives. Here's the point. On the fifth day, God created water creatures and air creatures, and he stinking blessed them to grow, to advance, and to multiply. So we got to shake ourselves and to say if all creation was designed by God to advance and to multiply and to take dominion, then why wouldn't the church have that same call, have that same boldness, have that same authority? Well, Pastor Darren, I'm not called to be bold. Yes, you are. It's just you've come up with a lie to, be, to justify your cowardness. In all of our hearts, there's areas where we're afraid. I love it when people say, Pastor Darren, you're fearless. No, that's not true. There are areas of my heart where I am fearful. And, and there are? Yeah, you just don't know about them. Why? Because I don't advertise them. But Pastor Darren, you're so bold. No, the reason why it appears as though I'm bold is because I don't do stuff unless I have faith to do it. Oh, you went into there and you had a conversation with them. Yeah, I did it and it wasn't hard. I did it because there was grace to do it. I had the faith to do it so there wasn't any margin of, there wasn't any place for fear. This is what I know, that whenever I get healed up of more stuff, Whenever a father reveals areas in my life that are not healed up, there within my life, fear gets pushed out. And there within that area of my life, I get more bold. And this is what I know, that the more healed up I get, the more childlike I become. Because if you want to be great in God's kingdom, you learn to be a child. And how do you learn to be a child? You, you give God all the areas within your life where you're, you're performing, where you're trying to maintain something, all the areas where you're, where you're shrinking back. I, I want to confess something to you, and, and I, don't, I don't know if it's going to change or not. We just, we just, we just finished our budget for, for next year, which is great, ahead of the curve. Usually that doesn't happen until another month from now. And we're sitting down, and we did a real conservative budget, and, and, and it's, it's, it's pretty balanced. But we only um, forecasted 7% growth next year. What does that make us? A nonprofit. Why? Because if we were publicly traded, I'd be getting fired. If we were a publicly traded company, 
and we were only projecting 7% growth, that would be unacceptable. But in the church, it's totally fine to maintain something. In the church, it's totally fine to shrink. It's totally fine. It's totally justified. The problem is, what excuse do we have when we've been blessed of God? But the spirit of, no, 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 it's not. Why aren't you growing? It's Jezebel. No, it's not. It's you. It's your defeaters. It's the lies that you believed. But we're a family. Kind of. Yeah, the king is our father. But this thing's governmental. What are you talking about? It's called the kingdom, yo. It means, yeah, you got a dad, but he's also a king. And stuff goes on and it's flipping and we come up with excuses and we did do this, that, and the other. We say, it's, it's acceptable. Yeah, people are going to hell and we don't really seem to care about it. But we can maintain something and we can, we can shrink back. We do, can do these different things. God says, no, I have blessed you. Why? Not so you can have a bigger TV. I have blessed you so that you can expand Eden. I have blessed you so that you can expand the kingdom. I have blessed you to advance righteousness. I have blessed you to make a difference. I have blessed you to be a lion, not a coward. I have blessed you with a reason, with a purpose. So stand up for something. Find your voice for something. He created you. On purpose, for such a time as this, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You're a linchpin of sorts, and yet religion and tradition and worldly thinking comes to trick us into thinking that we are replaceable. The devil is a liar. And if you are replaceable, it's because you're not being obedient. If you are replaceable, it's because you're not being obedient to what God has called you to do. You are not replaceable. There is no one on the planet that has ever had your DNA. There is no one on the planet that has ever had your fingerprint. There is no one on the planet that God has ever taken the time to knit together with your distinctiveness, with your talents, with your abilities, and yet we believe the lie of the enemy that God somehow copied and pasted us. That we're copied and pasted. On the fifth day, he created fishies and birdies, and he said, I love them. I love them, and they're useful, and they're beneficial, and they're beautiful. If he thinks that about the birdies and the fishies, what are his thoughts for you? What's he thinking about you? What's his thoughts for you? What's his thoughts for you? You can't go back anymore. You can't go back anymore. You can't go back to the hurt. You can't go back to the rejection. You can't go back to the blame. You can't even go back to the glory. Why? Because he's calling you into a new day. He's calling you to advance. He's calling for you to grow. And I don't see it. I don't believe it's optional. And the kingdom, I don't, you know what? I believe that when I'm in my 80s and 90s, I'm still going to be advancing. I'm still going to be growing. I'm going to be learning new things. I'm going to be bumming out young people. I'm going to be showing up at things I shouldn't be showing up. I'm, I'm still going to be creating stuff. They're going to be like, Dad, that was already created 20 years ago. I'm like, shut up, you know. <laughs> it's called virtual reality. We know, Dad. We know. We don't need the goggles anymore, Dad. Just put them on. <laughs> No, Dad, not going to wear the goggles. I'm committed to advance for the rest of my life. Man, when, when I stop advancing, it's because I started dying. Death doesn't occur when your heart stops. Death occurs when you're no longer dreaming. Death occurs when your whole life you're disobeying somebody else's orders, but you don't even hear from Father. Father. I'm not ready to die. How about you? I'm ready to live. And I want to live for him. I want to live from him. I want to know his voice. And I want to have the courage to follow it. I want to do things that I can't afford, that I don't deserve to do. I want to go places and see Jesus go with me. And I want to celebrate you as you do things that you can. I want to celebrate you as you create. I want to celebrate you as you butter off. I want to celebrate you as the glory and the supremacy and the majesty of Jesus is revealed through you. And I can't wait to hear what they say about you. Who is that? He can't do that. Who is that? Can they even do that? Can you even say that? That doesn't even look like something that the church does. Churches can't do that. 
It's because you call a church a building that has a service on a Sunday. That's not what the Bible calls a church. The Bible calls a church a people that are calculated, that have a function, diversity of giftings, that know their authority, that know their secret sauce, as that they are blessed of God. You reject me? <laughs> That's fine. I'm infinitely accepted. You steal from me? That's fine. He's my vine, not you. You push me out of the boat because of my own sinfulness? I got a daddy that loves me so much, he'll send a tanin to come and gobble me up until I repent. Let's go. Let's be creative. Let's think of some crazy stuff. Your sound, your, your rhythm, your, your frequency, your passion, your, your dreams, your hurts, the areas that the enemy has shamed you, he'll use all of it. The devil will say, God can't use you. You're disqualified. God will say, you're the perfect candidate. Let's offend some religious people. When you're doing the right thing, they'll talk trash about you. When you're doing nothing, they'll celebrate you. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the blessed ones say so. And let us say that we who are a blessed people will not tolerate, tolerate any lie that would frame poverty over our mind, will, and emotions, that would frame poverty over our children and our children's children, that would frame poverty over our church and our church's future, that would frame poverty over the great city of Seattle, that would frame poverty over our dreams and say, you can't, you can't do that. You can do that. You can do all things through Christ, who is your source gives you strength. Barak, blessed sons and daughters of God. You know what the Christmas story always reminds me of? God going out of his way to offend everybody. Look who I'm going to use. Look how I'm going to do it. Look where I'm going to do it. I'm going to fly right underneath your radar. Why? Because I, the Lord your God, do not jump through human hoops. I'll say it again. I, the Lord your God, do not jump through human hoops. He will not bow to our systems. He will not bow to our regulations. He will not bow to our absurdities. He is the Lord. Therefore, neither should you. Don't bow to absurdity. Don't bow to the chaos. Hover in it. Don't run from it. Don't try to survive in it. Own it. Create in it. Speak in it. Bring cosmos out of chaos. Knowing that you're blessed of God. And one day we will rule. We will literally rule and reign with King Jesus on this thing that he's given to us called the earth. I read something just recently, some, some uh, is a, I think children's education for children, and it said, the earth has been given to Satan. And I was like, not on my watch. Why? I have our original blueprint, you guys. It's called the book of Genesis. It's been given to the church as a gift from Father. The only way we'll go forward is to go back. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, jump up to your feet. We're done. You did good, class. <laughs> Thank you for being so respectful. And There's just a couple of you in the back passing notes, but that's okay. That's all good. 
just put out your hands, just assume the position, if you will, and just declare right now, my Father has empowered me for abundant living in every sphere of life. I distance myself from every thought that would like to keep me small, that would like to keep me predictable. I declare me and my family can do all things through Christ who is our source of strength. May Christ Jesus be your source and strength this holiday season and may you begin to dream with the King and what he wants to establish this coming year. Let us do it individually. Let us do it corporately. Let us do it unto this great King of glory. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. If you need prayer for anything, go ahead and come up. Our prayer ministry team, they'll pray for you. They'll stand with you. Otherwise, we'll be back tonight for our Christmas service, 6 p.m. God bless you. Love you.